Okay, I, I got a lot of, loud enough voice anyways, uh, but now I know I am coming through. Good to have you here this morning. It's a little bit cooler outside, so we get a bit of a reprieve, but I hope that doesn't mean fall's coming soon. I still want to enjoy some hot weather coming up here. So, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, today is the day in which we come to uh, gather together publicly uh, to worship God uh, for the things that He has done in our lives. Uh, you know, the good things, and a lot of times we take things for granted, and, and, uh, and we forget some of those things that He has uh, given us, you know, the air to breathe, or you know, just seats to sit on, uh, one another to uh, have interactions and friendships with. And so today is a day in which we focus on God and uh, the good things that He has done in our lives. And so uh, the, the needs that are in your hearts, uh, may God uh, meet those today and that uh, you will uh, be able to grow in your faith uh, here this morning. And so uh, this morning we're going to be uh, starting out uh, with um, uh, uh, kind of a new music team uh, this morning. But I want to read a, a scripture here from Colossians, and uh, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so I want to welcome you here this morning and for those who are watching online here today. Uh, today we're going to be uh, uh, singing one of this. It says, you know, let, let us sing uh, with psalms or hymns. And so today will be a service of hymns, uh, hymns that maybe we have not uh, sang for quite a while in our lives. And, and so th there's a lot of good uh, words that come through them. And then later on, our summer intern, uh, Connor Beduza, he's also our youth director, uh, will be carrying on in the fall. But uh, this is his summer internship, and this is his um, uh, kind of last time to preach in the summer here. And so he'll be coming up to uh, give us the word here today. And so I want to open in a word of prayer, and then our music team will come forward at this time. So let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Lord, uh, we ask that you would just uh, soften our hearts to, to your message, Lord, to your words in our hearts this morning. Lord, the needs that are there, that uh, we would um, just be met, those needs would be met today uh, in this service. And so I pray, Lord, today that uh, you would just be glorified in the songs that we sing, the message that is given, the communion that we will celebrate uh, later on here this morning. And so I pray your blessing upon each one today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today we will be using our hymn books. We'll be going to uh, number 542 first, if you want to follow along. I will be on the screen as well. Ah, okay. There we are. Yeah, so the first song we'll be doing is When We All Get to Heaven, and we'll be singing verses 1 and 4. If It's 542 in your hymn books, once again, if you wanted to uh, sing along in those as well. <laughs> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, sing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. When we shall tread the streets of gold when we all when we all get, get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be 
When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. The next song we'll be doing is number 508, if you're in the hymn book, and it is I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. We'll be singing verses 1 and 4 as well on this one. <coughs> I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. You can be seated. Good morning and welcome uh, to Grace Baptist Church. Uh, we welcome you if you are uh, watching online as well. Uh, we especially want to welcome you if you're first time visiting with us this morning. Uh, if it's your first time at Grace, hello. And um, if you want to know more about us, Say hi to someone around you, or you can talk to uh, whoever's at the welcome desk this morning. I know Wendy's on vacation, so I didn't see. I think it's June. June! June is there. Talk to June afterwards, and we've got a welcome gift for you. Um, VBS is coming up next week, so um, if you want to sign up uh, a child, please do so by August 12th. And again, if you um, are looking for more information, you can talk to um, June or to Debbie Contos or Debbie DeVries. Um, or you can register online also at graceairdry.ca slash VBS 2021. Um, we're also looking for 12 pineapples for Thursday, August 19th for VBS. So if you can donate a pineapple, uh, you can drop one off at the church. Or you can go crazy and drop off 12. Um, drop it off at the church office during office hours. We've got a couple of staff members who are leaving us at the end of the month. Debbie DeVries and James Damocles. So we're going to be having a uh, thank you and farewell gathering after the service on Sunday, August 29th. Um, so... There's going to be a card basket available for the next two weeks at the welcome desk or the church office. So if you'd like to drop off a card um, or a gift, you can do that. Um, family camp is the September long weekend, Labor Day weekend uh, at Whispering Pines. So if you'd like to register for that, you can do so at the welcome desk or again online, graceairdry.ca camp 2021. And then finally, there is uh, the offering plate for now is still at the welcome desk. So if you'd like to donate, um, you can drop off your offering at the welcome desk in the offering plate there. Or you can go online, graceairdry.ca slash donate. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, this opportunity to come together and worship you together this morning. 
Lord, we are so grateful for all that you do for us. We thank you um, that you are so kind and gracious, and we thank you that you have blessed us in so many ways. Lord, we would ask you that in this uh, kind of very dry time that you would send some rain. Um, and we think especially about the forest fires in British Columbia and across North America, really, that you would send rain um, and that those fires would get uh, put out, Lord. We pray also for those who are ill, who cannot be here today, um, and those that we may know, our loved ones who may be sick, we pray that you would give them healing and comfort. We would also just thank you that you are so good. We pray for each one here this morning that according to the riches of your glory, you would grant that each one would be strengthened with power through your spirit in, in our beings, Lord, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we can be rooted and grounded in love and have the strength to comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and that we would be filled with all of your fullness, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done. In Christ's name, amen. We'll be singing uh, number 527 in the hymn books next, Glory to His Name. We'll be doing all four verses. <laughs> Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad that I entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Lunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart the blood applied. Glory to his name. The next hymn we'll be doing is Trust and Obey, number 349 in your hymnals. 
We'll be doing verses 1 and 5. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. I suppose we'll be uh, hearing some preaching next. That'll be great. <laughs> Although, uh, despite their, su their size, and they're one of the largest animals, uh, elephants are frightened of one of the smallest things. Although they could easily stomp them, elephants avoid ants because they can easily get into their trunks and mess with the sensitive nerve endings that are in their trunks. So that's why they don't like ants. I honestly don't blame elephants, though. My wife and I have been at a war with ants in our house for the past few months, and it's kind of getting tiring, but they are, as Dr. Gordon Greaves told us, very diligent. <laughs> they keep coming back. I also kind of find it funny because elephant has ant in the word, but maybe that's just me, just with my English. I don't know, there's just a whole level of irony here. Here are some pretty spectacular facts about Elephants. They are the world's largest land animal. An elephant can weigh anywhere between two and seven tons. That's 4,000 to 14,000 pounds. Their trunks have mad skills. Elephants have around 150,000 muscle units in their trunk. Their trunks are perhaps the most sensitive organ found in any mammal. Asian elephants have been seen to pick up a peanut with their huge trunks, shell it, blow the shell out, and then eat it. 
just with their trunk. Uh, elephants use their trunks to suck up water to drink, and it can contain their trunk up to eight liters of water. And they also use their trunk to snorkel when they're underwater. Incredible. Elephants are constantly eating. They eat so much that they actually spend up to three quarters of their day eating. I thought I eat a lot, but elephants, I guess, eat more. They communicate through vibrations. Elephants communicate in a variety of ways, including sounds like trumpet calls. Some are even so low that humans can't even hear them. They communicate through body language, touch, and scent. They also communicate through seismic signals, sounds that create vibrations in the ground that only other elephants can hear. It's incredible. Calves can stand within 20 minutes of being born. What are we doing, humans? It takes us like a year or sometimes more. 20 minutes. After two days, they can keep up with the herd. And this incredible survival technique means that her herds of elephants can keep migrating to find food and water to thrive. And elephants never forget. So you may have heard that. It's pretty true. The elephant's temporal lobe, the area that the brain is associated with memory, is larger and denser than that of people. And so hence the saying, an elephant never forgets. Finally, a company in Thailand raises money for elephants by making coffee out of elephant poop. Huh? Maybe you're wondering about the coffee I'm holding in my hand. I can assure you, there is elephant poop coffee in this. And it's delicious. <laughs> so I, I can only get my hands on a very small quantity because this is one of the rarest coffees in the world. So it's actually mi mixed in with a lot of other beans. But I'm still drinking elephant poop coffee, and I thought that was great. On that note, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can be gathered here today. We thank you for humor and for the ability to laugh with one another. And God, we also thank you that you watch over each one of us. You know where we are and, Lord, what we're going through and what we're struggling with. As we look at Scripture today and look at maybe some lessons that we are learning from creation, from your creatures, would we be sensitive to that? Lord, all of creation is singing a song. They're praising you. And Lord, we need to but just stop and listen sometimes to the lessons that creation is singing out, God. Would you soften our hearts now? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Today, we're looking at lessons that elephants can teach us, elephant lessons. And like all of creation, as I just prayed singing their various songs, each one unique and beautiful, elephants have a lot that they can teach us. The title slide said loyalty, and I am going to be talking about loyalty. Elephants are very loyal creatures. But I actually decided to take this message in a different route. I'll still talk about loyalty, but it's going to be part of a bigger idea. And this something different that I was referring to is this. I want to give us a clear biblical example we can draw upon when we think about elephants or from the lessons that we learned today, a clear biblical example. Throughout the message, I'm going to point out various important lessons we can learn from elephants, and then we're going to look at the life of one particular individual in the Bible who models these lessons for us. And that individual is the Apostle Peter. Loyalty. Everything about the elephant represents loyalty. Loyalty runs very deep, whether it be to their family, to their own kind, or to the very nature throughout thousands of years. While male elephants leave the herd when they are about 12 to 15, female elephants form their own groups led by a matriarch. In these herds, they form a hierarchy based on age and generational knowledge. 
of safe and abundant spaces for food and water. These herds form tight social bonds that elicit strong emotions like grief and distress within members when their family members are injured or threatened. Elephants have been known to spend time with the remains of their ancestors as they pass through areas where family members have died. They will stop and take time to honor those ancestors. They know. And they sometimes stop there for weeks at a time. It's a time where they can once again recognize the life, loyalty, and respect of the creature that has died. I want to transition now to Peter. Here's a little backstory. Jesus did ministry on earth for about three years with his disciples. Near the end of their three years together, Jesus took his men out of Israel into Gentile territory. Side note, Jesus and his disciples were all Jews, of course, so they're entering Gentile territory. Um, And that's where, um, you know, people weren't Jews. They didn't come from um, the line of Israel. Gentiles were those that were not part of this traditional group God called his chosen people. So Jesus took them into this territory so that he could have some time alone with them, away from the demands of the crowd. There he asked them, who do people say that I am? They answered, some say you're John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. That was the word on the streets, at least. They tried to have identified Jesus by using familiar categories, but Jesus didn't really fit any of those. He was something more than a prophet. What about you, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter had been thinking about this very question ever since the miraculous catch of fish when Jesus called him. He'd been thinking about this. He'd seen all the miracles, heard all the teachings, and suddenly, in this moment, the last piece of the puzzle dropped into place for Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter said. That's a mouthful. The Christ was the long-awaited Jewish Messiah who fulfilled all the promises of the Old Testament. And Peter recognized that Jesus, the Messiah, was more than human. He was the divine Son of God. Jesus said, You're blessed, Simon, because my Father has revealed this to you. In other words, Peter, you didn't figure this out on your own. No one told you. God revealed this to you. A Jewish man could never have come to the conclusion that Peter had on his own, that someone else was divine. Peter couldn't come to that conclusion on his own. This was so far out of the normal categories that it required a revelation from God. That's Peter's big moment right here. He got it right. And Jesus says all kinds of great things about him after this. Peter was so loyal and was such a fierce follower of Jesus. We learn that later he even attempted and succeeded at cutting off another dude's ear to protect Jesus. In this moment, Peter's on top of the world. He's right by Jesus. Jesus goes on to announce that he's headed to Jerusalem, where he's going to suffer and die and then raise again. Peter, full of himself, he takes Jesus aside discreetly and rebukes him. Jesus, no, this will never happen to you. No way. It's almost like Peter is saying, Jesus, have you forgotten what I just said about you? It's almost like... uh, Jesus, you're the Messiah, the Son of God, for Pete's sake. He caught it. Good. You're not going to suffer and die. Peter had his own ideas about what the Messiah would do. He was going to go to Jerusalem to reign as a king, not die on a cross. So Peter straightens Jesus out. Never a good idea, by the way. 
Jesus actually said, get behind me, Satan. He says that right to Peter. He's not saying you are Satan. He's saying you're in my way. You don't have the mind of the things of God, but of men. Just like Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Satan was tempting him. Get behind me, Satan. He says that to Peter. What does the old proverb say? Pride comes before the fall. Yes, you've heard that. Peter got a big head and Jesus kind of popped his bubble, so to speak. From the top of the world, so loyal to the bottom of the pile. From God revealed this to you to get behind me, Satan. Peter learned how quickly we can fall when we get so full of ourselves. He had to learn it again later in a much more painful way. You see, Peter was loyal to Jesus, and I truly believe that Peter loved Jesus a lot. But like many people in his time, he was kind of misguided about what Jesus had really come to do. And this led to his fall. Elephants feel remorse, as you know that. Every living creature makes mistakes. A gazelle makes a wrong turn and is all the closer to death by cheetah. A mama bear leaves her cub somewhere. An elephant accidentally or on purpose tramples someone. The crazy thing, though, is that elephants actually feel remorse. They are such empathetic creatures. We talked about how loyal elephants are and that they will stop for a significant amount of time to grieve loved ones or ancestors. Well, elephants also grieve the loss of those they kill. They grieve the loss of those that they kill. There's stories of elephants trampling a human or an animal, and then they'll actually take the body that's dead, and they will take it off, and they will give it a proper burial. Elephants have been observed even mourning the dead of unfamiliar creatures by stroking the carcass as they pass it in the wild. Here in the West, though, I admit, sometimes we're not very good at grieving, mourning, lamenting, feeling remorse or regret, or even just thinking about death. We try to stay so far away from death as possible We even have come up with the term, someone has passed on instead of died. Elephants know how to grieve. They also feel remorse for their actions. And one of the facts that I gave earlier, an elephant never forgets. They carry trauma and grief with them for the rest of their lives. And that's not always bad. If you can't feel something towards the actions that you make, will subsequent actions or decisions you make be any wiser? Back to our story about Peter. On the last night of Jesus' life, as they were sharing the Last Supper together, Jesus warned them, this very night you will all fall away from me. The scripture predicts, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Peter piped up, Lord, if if all of those others fall away, I, I will not fall away, Jesus. I will not fall away. Peter was all in. Remember, he was very loyal. I love Peter for that. Jesus looked Peter in the eyes, straight in the eyes, and he said, Peter, tonight... Before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me three times. I I almost imagine Peter in that situation right there. Peter was horrified. Lord, I would never disown you. Even if I have to die, I will never disown you. And I believe in that moment that Peter, he was absolutely sincere. He meant every word he said, but unfortunately, He overestimated his strength. Later that night when Jesus was arrested, Peter was the only one who resisted. He pulled his sword and took a swing at one of the arresting members and chopped 
Malchus's ear right off. Jesus intervened before it got any more crazy. Put your sword away, Peter. I have to do what God says. Then Jesus reached out, touched Malchus, and healed his ear. Healed his ear. Don't you love Jesus? They arrested Jesus, and the disciples ran off into the dark. But Peter, his bold promise, still brightened his memory, followed the mob at a distance. He followed the mob at a distance. He entered the high priest's courtyard, and there he warmed himself by a fire while Jesus was being tried. A girl in the courtyard recognized him. Hey, you were with them. You, you were with Jesus. And Peter responded, I don't know what you're talking about. Peter walked away from the fire toward the gate where another girl said, I recognize you. You were with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter denied it again. I swear, I don't know the man. A, while, a little while later, a man approached Peter. You're one of them. Your Galilean accent gives you away. Peter swore and called down curses on himself. As God is my witness, may he damn me if I'm not telling the truth. I do not know the man. Just then, a rooster crowed. Now I imagine Jesus turning and looking straight at Peter in the eyes. Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And Peter rushed out of the courtyard, it says, weeping. Peter is a bundle of contradictions. On the one hand, he alone was courageous enough to follow Jesus right into the high priest's courtyard. On the other, his courage failed him when he was confronted and faced with the possibility of being arrested himself. On the one hand, he sincerely promises his devotion to the death if necessary. But on the other, he disowns Jesus at the first sign of danger. Peter's tears in that moment as he ran away weeping, his tears tell us a lot. He was earnest about his promise and heartbroken about his failure. But Jesus specializes in healing broken hearts. Did you know that elephants never stop growing? There's some scholarship that is not too sure on this, but at least their tusks, I believe, never stop growing. Longer tusks can be a sign of old age. Elephants are always gaining in size from birth to death. But they also continue to gain in wisdom from birth to death. They're always growing. Back to Peter. Even after Jesus' resurrection, his failure dogged him. Yes, Jesus was alive. But would Jesus want Peter as a follower any longer? Peter couldn't imagine why Jesus would want what he thought was a colossal screw-up. So one day, Peter said to some of the other guys, I'm going fishing. And this was not a weekend recreational thing where he and a bunch of buddies go off fishing. This was him going back to his old life of fishing. This was Peter giving up on being a disciple. I'm going fishing, he said. And six other disciples said, yeah, we're with you, Peter. Even in Peter's discouraged state, he was still a leader. He took six guys with him back to the old life. They fished all night and caught nothing. Does that sound familiar? It's kind of deja vu in Peter's life. He was catching nothing before when Jesus came. Now he's catching nothing again. 
Early in the morning, Jesus arrived on the shore. They didn't know it was him. He called out, friends, do you have any fish? Maybe they thought he was a fishmonger. He was looking for fish for the market. No, they shouted back. Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Well, why not? They had nothing else to lose. They'd failed all night. So they did. And suddenly their net was so full of fish that they actually couldn't haul it into the boat. It was so heavy. They had to drag it behind them. John was the first to recognize Jesus. So John turns to Peter and was like, It's the Lord! As soon as Peter hears this, he jumps into the water to be the first to shore. At this point in the day, though, Peter is stripped for work. That's how they worked. They were in their underwear. He's stripped. Uh, like he's, I'm talking, he's almost naked here. And Peter, he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to meet Jesus naked. So uh, what does he do? It says in there that he, he uh, before he dove on, he put on his tunic. Most would strip to swim, but not Peter. You got to love that. That's the kind of bundle of contradictions that we see again. The guy who led the desertion is the first one to jump in the water and get to Jesus. On the beach, Jesus has a fire going with fish and some bread. Come, have breakfast with me. I love that. Jesus tracks down the wandering disciples and invites them to breakfast. Let's enjoy breakfast and then we'll chat. But I can imagine no one was enjoying or saying anything. They all knew it was the Lord. They were probably staring at their feet as they slowly swallowed bits of food. They were caught red-handed. I'm imagining it was a silent breakfast. It's like that moment in a movie where crickets are awkwardly playing in the background. The silence was broken by Jesus. He turns to Peter and asks, Simon, Do you love me more than these? Perhaps as Jesus said this, he swung his hand towards the boat, saying, Simon, do you love me more than this old life, your life of fishing? Or perhaps, maybe as Jesus said this, he swung his hands toward the other disciples. Simon, do you love me more than these? Remember, Peter had previously said, even if everyone disowns you, I won't. In essence, Peter claimed to love Jesus more than all the others. So maybe that's what Jesus meant. Maybe it's both. Peter quietly said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Interesting thing here. Jesus used the Greek word agape. When he said, Simon, do you love me? Do you agape me? That's the highest word for love. The love of pure commitment to another's well-being. But Peter answered Jesus with the word phile, which is more like a brotherly love. The word for affection and friendship. Now this is, I'm imagining, this is, this is me kind of bringing it down a little bit. I'm imagining this is sort of like... Uh, This is like a guy who tells the girl, I love you, and she says, let's be friends. That's not a perfect example at all, but it kind of shows a bit of the contrast there, if you see it. Jesus says, Simon, do you love me? Do you agape me? And then Peter responds, Lord, I really like you a lot. I feel you. Peter had overpromised and underdelivered before, and he was still feeling the effects from his previous failure. He wasn't about to make that same mistake again. I really like you, Lord, a lot. Then feed my lambs, Jesus said. Jesus repeated the question here again Simon, do you love me? Do you agape me? Again, Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know that I feel you. I really like you a lot. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. 
Jesus asked one more time, and you can read the Greek if you want here. Jesus asked one more time. This time, he changed his question. Simon, do you feel me? Do you feel me? Do you really like me? And Peter, at this point, he was grieved that Jesus had to ask a question because he already said that. Yes, I, I feel you. He says he's grieved that Jesus asked him. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I feel you. And feed my sheep. And so, in this moment, Peter was restored back in the saddle. And this is one of my favorite stories. One thing that's always spoken to me is that when Jesus tracks Peter down after he failed and deserted, Jesus only asks one question. Do you love me? There was no recrimination. And that's a big fancy word for accusation or blame. There was none of that. Jesus didn't say, why did you disown me? Why did you lie? And why the stink are you going back fishing? Jesus didn't say that. Just do you love me? Because if you love me, Peter, I can do something wonderful with your life. Some of you need to hear that. You failed and you've fallen and crashed. And like Peter, you think Jesus is probably done with you. He's not. He's asking, do you love me? And notice that when Peter was unwilling or unable to use the higher word for love, Jesus actually accommodated him in that moment. It's like Peter said, Lord, I don't want to overpromise again. I love you, but I don't want to overpromise. I'm your friend. And Jesus said, Okay, I'll take that and we'll go from there. You'll grow. You'll grow. Jesus is asking us, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, we do love you. I love you. But even my best love is weak. Sometimes we fail, mess up, even doubt you, Lord. Jesus understands this and takes us where we are. He works with us as we continue to grow all throughout life. Feed my sheep, Jesus responds. That's exactly what Peter went on to do and what we're called to do. Intentionally move. Elephants need water. They need food. Remember how much they eat. Unlike sloths or koalas who never really leave their source of food, elephants consume so much food and water that they must keep on moving from location to location. Elephants migrate as far as they must go to seek food and water. They don't just sit around either and hope that food or water appears. When push comes to shove, they'll even create their own wells by digging up water so that they and smaller creatures can enjoy that water. Maybe you've heard, as of late, uh, China's wandering elephants. As of mid-July, a herd of elephants in China have traveled over 500 kilometers from their original grazing lands. They sensed the lack of food and water and decided to trek across China to see if they could find something better. Now that takes a lot of guts. We just heard about Jesus and his breakfast with some of his disciples. And well, Peter's convo with Jesus, it led to action. Peter went on to become one of the primary leaders of the early church. He preached the first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost on Acts 2. And 3,000 people believed and were baptized. He led over the church in Jerusalem. He healed people. He worked miracles. He preached to crowds. He was arrested and jailed and miraculously released. Peter went on to Samaria to affirm the birth of the church there. Later, God used Peter to bring the first Gentile into, Gentile into the church, a Roman soldier named Cornelius. 
Peter was instrumental in the Jerusalem council that made it possible for Gentiles to freely become Christians and for the church to spread throughout the Roman Empire. Peter eventually wrote two letters that were circulated among the churches, known to us as First and Second Peter. Legend has it that Peter was crucified upside down in Rome, a martyr for Jesus. Do you think he had any regrets there? Do you think he wished he had stayed a fisherman in Capernaum? Peter lived an extraordinary life following Jesus. His tra trajectory was radically changed, and from fisherman to fisher of men, from backwater businessman to global apostle, he grew. The main point that I want to get across to you with this last point I just said is this. Are you willing to move in the direction of your prayers? I heard this a few years ago from a friend in university, and it's always stuck with me. When someone has something terrible come up in their life, maybe a family member's died, or they recently lost their job, what's one of the first responses? I'm sorry, and I'll pray for you. And that is amazing. That is good. We are called to lift each other up in prayer, to bring them before God, but we're also called to partner with God in continuing his kingdom work, his work of love, mercy, and justice. If I'm being honest, the typical response of, I'll pray for you, for many, even for myself, has become an excuse. Just a way for you to give a quick answer and subconsciously wash your hands of the situation because maybe you think, God's in control, and there's nothing that I can really do. Or you don't really have time to address this deep life issue. Or you just don't really know how else to respond. If that's your idea of prayer, and it's been mine for a while, sometimes I slip into that. I encourage us to think about prayer a little more deeply and a little more fiercely. When some of you tell me that you're going to pray for me or for others, I believe you. I know there are so many prayer warriors who make an important part of their lives to pray for others, to really pray for others. And God sees that. As we close today, though, what I'm trying to leave with all of us today is this. When you pray, when you're talking with God, with Jesus, are you willing to walk in the direction of that conversation? Are you willing to walk in the direction of your prayers? Are you willing to partner with God? And maybe that's a little unsettling um, because your heart is really grasping to this idea. For that, I'm lovingly not sorry. Prayer is so, so important, and we should absolutely pray. But after we pray, we should also take action. I believe that God wants us to be a blessing for other people in his name. We just have to be willing to step out in faith. To not wait around, but to press on like the elephants. Just to be clear, the issue here isn't at all with prayer. Prayer is absolutely the most important thing we can do. Rather, the issue is with saying the words, I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you without being willing to, willing to do anything else. The issue is the excuses we make to avoid going out of our comfort zones to help others. The issue is not being willing to be used by God to serve others. When the crowds came to Jesus for food and healing, did he say, I'll pray for you and then walk away? No, he took action. He fed them. He healed them. He touched the man with leprosy. He stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with demons to save a life. He defended the sinful woman from the Pharisees. At one point in Mark 1, 35-39, Jesus is off praying by himself, it says. Some of the disciples find him and exclaim, everyone's looking for you. Jesus responds, yeah, let's go to nearby towns so I can preach there too. 
And when he arrived, he preached and he drove out the demons. Jesus started in prayer, which led to action. Don't, don't we want to be like Jesus? Don't we want to be Jesus' hands and feet in this world? Be like an elephant. Be like Peter. Would you pray with me as the rest of the worship team comes up? Father, we thank you for today that we can gather in a safe place where we can freely worship. Lord, there are places in this world where that cannot happen. God, we thank you for Scripture. For the story of Peter, and even though he is a bundle of contradictions, it often reminds us of ourselves and how contradictory we can be. But Lord, you are willing to work with us. You are willing to help us grow. And God, as we go throughout this week, would we be willing to move in the directions of our prayer? Lord, that when we pray, God, that that can spur us on to action. Would we partner with you? Thank you, Jesus, for these truths. And Lord, would you bless this congregation? In Jesus' name, amen. John will now lead us in a time of communion together. Uh, the worship team, uh, you can have a seat if you want at this time. Uh, thank you, Connor, for uh, you know the, leading us in that uh, lesson uh, between an elephant and Peter's life. And uh, great to see how some of those uh, images come through. Uh, part of our series has been lessons from God's creatures and the things that we can learn and how they uh, you know adapt into uh, people from scripture as well and so and Connor I'm glad we found the elephant in the room so it's good they see that <laughs> so, so we're gonna uh, we, we want to spend the time uh, in communion there are times in our lives where we are unfaithful but God is always faithful God is always loyal to us he sent his one and only son to this world so that we might find everlasting life and so today, uh, if you do not have a relationship with God, I encourage you to uh, take that step of faith, to invite Jesus into your life, and, and you know, to, to love him back. Jesus loves you with that agape love, and he wants you to love him back. And so I encourage you to take that step. Uh, today we are going to uh, celebrate uh, communion of Jesus' loyalty to us, his love for us. And I want to uh, read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23, this is Paul writing these words. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we want to uh, partake together. Uh, if anyone has not uh, received uh, the little cup that we, uh, as you came in, just put up your hands on our ushers. I will uh, hand you one of our communion cups uh, for us. Uh, we're probably uh, eventually going to come back to the, the normal way of, in which we've done communion, but uh, these cups, uh, I'll just explain, um, the top layer, there's two layers to this, and so the top layer has the bread part or the wafer, and then the, the second layer is the juice. And so we'll just uh, wait until everyone uh, has uh, a cup here today. On the night uh, before uh, Jesus was crucified, he met with his disciples. And it was the Passover meal that they were celebrating to remember God's deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt. 
Well, Jesus refers now to himself as the Passover lamb, his deliverance in each of our lives. And so he took the bread and he said, take this bread and eat it in remembrance of me. And so let us partake of the bread. He then took the cup, which symbolized his shed blood on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And without it, we would have no remission of sins. And so today we want to partake of this cup. And he offered it to his disciples saying, drink of this cup, all of you. Let us partake together. Father, today we uh, have uh, come to you to worship Lord, to adore you. We thank you for this lesson on loyalty. Lord, on your love for us. Lord, no matter what we have done, you continue to pursue us much like you did Peter. Lord, that you pursued him and gave him that second chance. Lord, to use him greatly. And Lord, for each one of us, no matter what we have done, you pursue us so that you can give each one of us a second chance to be used greatly in your kingdom. And so I pray your blessing upon our time here, Lord, that as we go into this week, that you would use us to be a blessing to others as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to uh, sing our theme song here, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Uh, this kind of uh, flows in with our lessons from God's creatures. So I'm going to invite our worship team at this time. Uh, once our um, uh, service is finished, there is a, a garbage pails out there to uh, dispose of these cups. So again, may God bless you and have a great week ahead. Things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, and all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens up, each little bird that sings He made their glowing colors And He made their tiny wings The purple-headed mountain The river running by The sunset and the morning light All creatures great and small And all things wise and wonderful The Lord God made them all The cold wind in the winter time The pleasant summer sun the ripe fruits in the garden now, He made them every one. He gave us eyes to see them all, and lips that we might tell. How great is the Almighty God, who has made all things well. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, and all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Thank you, worship team, this morning for the hymn sing today. Um, now, as you go into your weeks, may God protect you, 
And may he be your guide. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Yes, let's sing it. On this message we bring glorious Zilcoyan King, wonderful words of the King. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming.